Would you buy flip-flops to climb Mount Everest? Would you take your local pastor to the swinger club? Or would you wear a cop costume to a BLM rally? Probably not, right? So why does a couch potato get an Australian Shepherd, a novice dog owner a Malinois, or an avid hiker a Bulldog? It seems a lot of people spend more time researching what type of toys to buy their dogs rather than which type of dog to get in the first place. Depending on what type of toy you buy, you may have it for a couple months, weeks, maybe just a few hours. But a dog, you're gonna have your dog for about 15 years, maybe more, maybe less. So take a moment and think where you might be in 15 years. Or just get a great Dane, then he'll only last six to eight years. In order to set yourself up for success, it will really help if you get a dog that fits your lifestyle rather than having to adapt your life to your dog. So stay tuned and stick with us to find out which type of dog best suits your lifestyle. By the way, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the bell in the lower right corner. And if you want to rewatch a certain part of this video or fast forward to a specific point, down in the comments below, there's a timestamp with each section that might be of importance to you. So before we look at which type of dog might be the best for you, let's briefly outline the different groups that we can classify these dogs into. And if you're not sure about whether you should get a puppy or an adult dog, then rewatch this video up here and let us help you find out. All dogs have a great sense of smell, but there's one that does so in particular, namely the hound dogs. Bred as hunting dogs, they are usually pretty easy going and get along well with humans and other dogs. Cats, rabbits or hamsters, mm, not so much. They tend to be a bit more independent, thus less likely to develop separation anxiety and generally are not very touch sensitive since they're bred to withstand touch. So this is a plus if you have children in your home. This hunting dog group is made up of two different subgroups, the side hounds and the scent hounds. As the name suggests, scent hounds seek their game with their noses, whether these are rabbits, badgers, mountain lions, or millennials. They may keep their head low to the ground or high up in the air to get a whiff of that scent and find their track. They usually have long droopy ears and loose moist lips, which are said to help them pick up scent off the ground. And once they hit that scent, Boy, good luck making them pay attention to you. So definitely invest your time in training a good heel. The other subgroup in this is the sight hound, which again, as the name suggests, they go more by their sight. They use their speed and agility to capture their prey and can easily make you fall flat on your face if they see something they want to chase and you don't have good control over them. But once the prey is out of sight, it's usually out of mind. Hmm. That reminds me of this girl I used to date. Anyway, next is the toy group, which is mostly made out of plastic. No, nah, never mind, just kidding. These are the small dogs that usually require a bell on their collar just so that you don't step on them. These dogs were created for entertainment and companionship, so they can be very good dogs for those who are simply looking for company and also for the elderly people. Just keep in mind that the smaller the dog, the longer it is likely to live. With toy dogs, this can even be up to 20 years. With such short intestinal tracks, these dogs can be a bit more difficult to potty train though this just requires the owner to keep a stricter schedule. They're also prone to improper socialization as young dogs because they're often carried around too much or kept at home and not interacting with the environment. They also often show behavior problems, which again, is sometimes because of the owners are not taking training seriously. After all, a Chihuahua protecting the couch is a little different than a German Shepherd protecting it. The herding group, originally bred for instinct and decision making, to assist humans with protecting and gathering their livestock, are very much stimulated by movement and as her name reveals, love herding. So if you have children running around the yard, don't be surprised if your herding dog tries to hurt them and nips at their ankles. They also have a high likelihood of chasing cars and bicycles around and require lots and lots of physical and mental stimulation. Which is why many of them are great for different types of dog sports such as frisbee, fly ball or agility. If they end up in the wrong environment, however, and don't get the stimulation they require, they may develop OCD. So just because you saw an Australian Shepherd doing awesome tricks on America's Got Talent, does not necessarily mean it's the best dog for you if you just want to watch dog tricks on sports on TV rather than actually doing them yourself. And that brings us to our next dog group, which are the sporting dog. Sporting dogs are hunting dogs, which are bred to search for and retrieve game birds and waterfowl. They therefore tend to have a soft mouth in order to be able to remove the quarry. They are typically active and alert and bred to work closely with hunters, so less independent than the hound dogs. Sporting dogs generally make well-rounded companions, especially for the outdoors and active type of dog owner. 
Many of them are easy to train and not dominant, making them a good choice for the novice owner. They are furthermore divided into four subgroups, namely Retrievers, who are generally not touch or sound sensitive, making them great for families with children. Spaniels, who are generally happy to work for the humans and rarely difficult to handle and usually pretty social. Pointers, who were bred to run long distances and therefore need lots and lots of heavy exercise daily as well as good direction. And setters, who have a tendency to be happy, playful dogs and are usually very friendly to both humans and other dogs. Next we have the terriers, whose name does not stem from terror, but rather from terra or earth. They were originally kept to hunt vermin, which a lot of people don't know. Because many small rodents live or hide in the ground, terriers are said to go to the ground after their prey. If you thought cats were good at catching rats, look up ratting with terriers on YouTube. But wait! Finish watching this video first. While some terriers are small and cute, don't make the mistake of thinking that they're great apartment dogs. They have a strong predatory instinct and are very vocal because of it. So your next door neighbor might not appreciate hearing him all the time while you're at work. Some need lots of exercise, such as a Jack Russell Terrier. And if you have a beautiful yard full of flowers, guess what? They will love it too, but for all the wrong reasons, because terriers are natural diggers. Most terriers are happiest when given a job to do and not being left alone for too long or they will find ways to entertain themselves, which usually will not be in a way that entertains you. Next up is the working dog group and I'm realizing that this video is a little bit longer than I had expected, but you know, it is a very important decision so do give me four hours of your time. No, I'm just kidding, only three. Working dogs are large and strong dogs which are unsuitable for most families, though a lot of them decide to get them as their first dogs and also as the first dog that they will be abandoning. Working dogs were bred for jobs like guarding flocks, guarding large estates, water rescue, aiding fishermen, pulling carts. They're often persistent, protective and dominant, so knowing a little bit about dog behavior, dog training and how to handle dogs is really useful. They require good leadership and early training and can be broken down into five subgroups. Gentle Giants, these are the exception to the rule and as their name suggests are usually born very social. Because of their size many of these were used to pull cards but because of their demeanor also to pull drowning victims out of the water. Mastiffs, these are very old breeds who got spread all around the world as they accompanied soldiers into battle. The Romans exported them from England to fight in their arenas of ancient Rome against bears, lions, tigers, bulls, other dogs and human gladiators. They can easily exceed 100 pounds, but funny enough, most don't require a lot of exercise and are very loving animals who make pretty good family dogs, protecting them by means of mere intimidation, but they still need a lot of training and good leadership. Guard dogs. These are used to guard against unexpected animals or people and are very physically and mentally strong. Not training them properly is like having a loaded gun in your baby's crib. Guardians of the flock. Guardians of the flock are often raised with the flock they are meant to protect and thus end up seeing themselves as a sheep, for example, rather than a dog, but a feisty sheep you don't want to mess with. They are generally very independent, vocal at night to show that they are on duty, don't like humans so much, especially unannounced visitors, and require lots and lots of early socialization and training. Do yourself a favor and don't get a guardian of the flock unless you actually have a job for this dog, guarding flock. And finally, the Nordic group, which even though created as a working dog to pull sleds, can be considered a group of its own. These guys love to pull, are pretty athletic and very independent. They're escape artists, and once they're gone, you're not likely to see them again. They're often very stubborn and require lots of training and problem solving as you go along. They also need lots of grooming due to excessive shedding and can be pretty vocal, howling away to the delight of your neighbors. Also, please don't get these if you live in a very hot climate. Finally, the last group is the non-sport group, which is just basically made up of all other dogs that did not fit into these categories, so it's very hard to generalize. A lot of them make good watchdogs, which will bark and alert, but not bite. And then there are, of course, also the mixed breeds, or the mutts, who will show very different personalities and looks. From my experience, this varies greatly on geographic location as well. In Latin America, for example, I've come across many feral dogs who have influences from many types of dogs and start mimicking each other in their looks. Often these dogs are very well socialized since they're exposed to a lot of stimuli from a very early age. But many times they also show a disconnect from humans as they have learned to live on their own. But at the same time, they're usually not as high maintenance as a lot of pure breed dogs. And from my experience, they also have to visit the vet less often because they've just learned to be more resilient. But as I said, it's very difficult to generalize and this is just speaking from my own experience. Okay, so now that we have gotten through this, let's take a look 
to see what you need to take into consideration to choose the right breed for you. In the description, you can also find a link to our website where we're gonna put a little bit more info on dog breeds and highlight certain breeds for you. This is gonna be a work in progress, so just keep checking back or leave a comment down below if you'd like for us to single out a certain breed. All right guys, so since this video is a little bit longer than I was expecting, we're just gonna call it quits here and do a second part. So if you're watching this close to the release, just hit that bell, subscribe to us, so that you'll get a notification of when the next video drops. And if you're already watching this at a later point, then it will be linked right here.